Good morning, everyone. Good yeah. Morning, everyone. Uh, we're we're going to get started now. Last we're, day at the 10 a.m. slot. Yeah, this is my fourth, <laughs> and then we're ready. I'm ready to go home. Fourth briefing at DEF CON. Let's do it. Uh, okay, so since uh, since I guess we introduce ourselves right now, um, I'm Katie Trimble. Uh, I am the Section Chief for Vulnerability Management and Coordination at Department of Homeland Security. Um, so that means that I do uh, all things vulnerability uh, related to cybersecurity things. Uh, I do not do threat, uh, I do vulnerability. So uh, under that, you might have, different. they are, they are, they're very different. Um, so uh, under that, you might have heard of a couple programs that we run. They're small programs, just real small. So MITRE CVE program. Uh, so I'm the program manager for that, and I sit on the MITRE CVE board of directors. Um, so if you have a problem, please let me know, because I'm the I'm the buck stops with Katie. Um, uh, positive feedback is appreciated. Negative feedback, I'm happy to discuss. Um, then uh, the NIST NVD program, uh, I'm also responsible for that. Uh, the Carnegie Mellon Cert CC program, I sponsor that. Uh, and then, you're welcome. <laughs> We're sponsoring, please. <laughs> Happy to help. Um, and the uh, ICS CERT vulnerability uh, management program, I sponsor that as well. So about nine federal employees, three contractors, and 50 consultants in seven states. So we're a real small program. Um, we coordinate vulnerabilities for disclosure. So uh, about 7,708 vulnerabilities from January 1st to uh, June of this year alone. Last year was 14,000 IT vulnerabilities, 800 ICS vulnerabilities for disclosure. So that is what I do, uh, and art. Just watch here. So yeah, as Katie mentioned, uh, I'm part of the Carnegie Mellon CERT Coordination Center. DHS is our largest sponsor of that work. So thank you, thank you, DHS. Um, yeah, Art Mannion, I'm a vulnerability analysis technical manager. I have a small team of around 15 there. Um, one of the main things we do is the coordinated disclosure work that, that Katie describes there. Um, the CERT Coordination start Center started in 1988. The first thing we published was a vulnerability advisory for bugs that the Morris Worm exploited. And I think this week we published some, an advisory for bugs that are a problem. So, um, you know, in 30 years, we have not been able to produce software that is bug free. Um, we want to, my attitude is to accept that. And uh, as a result, we need to fix bugs as they're found. And there's really no other answer than you have to be able to receive bug reports, fix them, and move on with your business. Um, so we're going to cover a couple of things here. CVD is the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure part, uh, and I will let Katie take the first chunk here. So. So we're just going to do this back and forth game yeah. this whole time, so sorry. It's, it's, not, it's not normally this disruptive, but we'll, we'll deal with it. All right, so uh, we, when we look at vulnerabilities, we say, like, what is a vulnerability? Um, there's two kinds of vulnerabilities in this world. There's vulnerability, the noun, which is, like, all things inclusive. So, like, you don't have CCTVs on your building. That's a vulnerability in this big, like, noun sense. And then there's uh, vulnerabilities as an adjective, so something describing something else. And that's really where we work. We work at the micro level. So we're talking about specific vulnerabilities CVEs in software, hardware, um, and digital services. Um, so when we're looking at the definition of what we consider a vulnerability, we're saying that it is a flaw in the system that allows an adversary to do things that were not intended by the producer of that system. Um, they typically come in three forms. You have your hardware, your software, and your digital services. Um, when we would look at this, we would say like um, flight software in the aviation world would be, uh, so like a flight simulator software or software that allows the, the um, ground to communicate with whatever. That, those are software, very, very software specific. Hardware would be the plane. Um, and then digital services are things like um, flight booking systems, uh, things that you have access to from the internet. Um, so, so that's kind of how we define them. Uh, up until fairly recently, vulnerabilities in digital services were not something that was covered by Department of Homeland Security. We only look at uh, product vulnerabilities. We've had to change scope a little bit to adapt for the kind of the changing environment of coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So we are kind of getting into the realm of digital services. So that's new for us. We're in a learning curve, too. Um, We'll go to the next. All right, so coordinated vulnerability disclosure. What that is, uh, researchers come to us, we work with the research community, and we say, okay, uh, bring us your vulnerabilities. Did you contact the vendor? If there's a problem with the vendor, if the vendor is not uh, able to fix it or we're not willing to fix it, or there's a contentious relationship, someone has lawyered up, um, or if the vendor has absolutely no idea, sometimes we see those in, um, we, we have vendors who don't realize they're vendors, which is, 
weird, but it happened. Somebody whose mission was to do something else, and then they suddenly started selling their platform as a service. Um, they're like, oh, I'm a news outlet, but now I'm a software as a service vendor? Yes, you are. If you're selling your platform, you are definitely a vendor now. Yeah, they're good, right? It's really entertaining. They needed an alternate revenue stream, so they just started selling their, their app to other, to other, to other news outlets. And they're like, oh, no. Um, so... Uh, researchers come to us. Anything that comes to us is exempt from, uh, if you're familiar with what's called the vulnerabilities equities process, which is the government-led process that weighs national security against um, uh, intelligence collection, right? So it's a, about 18 different agencies uh, all sit down at the table, federal government agencies, and talk about vulnerabilities. Uh, DHS is on the defensive side of that, which means we want to release everything. Um, any vulnerability that's brought to us from the public that was, and I'll give you the exact quote for from the charter, anything that was discovered during the course of incident response or security research which is intended to be disclosed does not make the threshold for VEP. Which means anything that's brought to the Department of Homeland Security by an independent source that was not discovered with the intention to use to attack an adversary does not make the threshold for VEP. We don't provide any of that information. Everything we do is about disclosing. We hold nothing back. We have no big database behind us. We don't... Uh, um, we are all about closing tickets. My job's to close tickets. My performance plan is based on closing tickets. If I don't close tickets, I get in trouble. I have a time window for closing tickets. It's 45 days. Um, 45 days to 90 days, depending on what it is. We have some flexibility in that. Um, so when we talk about building a mitigation schedule, that's, that's that flexibility. So researcher notifies us that there's a problem, there's a vulnerability, they've tried to coordinate it with the vendor, they got no love there. Um, we then take that vulnerability. Department of Homeland Security does not find vulnerabilities ourselves. Um, we cannot do that because there are legal liability issues that are involved there. Um, in select cases, we may, but that's only at the uh, express request of the vendor. Um, so we, we typically don't. We pass those vulnerabilities to the vendor. We immediately contact the vendor and say, hey, we've got this vulnerability. Can you please validate this? Look at this. Tell us what this is. Um, then we work between the vendor and the researcher to come to a conclusion, to, de to define a mitigation schedule, to get a patch created. We make sure all the patches work. Um, and then we everyone publishes at the same time. That's what coordinated vulnerability disclosure is. It's the opportunity for everyone to be on the same page, but no one to spill anything. So it's kind of like a standoff. Everyone holds guns on each other and nobody says anything till everyone says everything. Um, and we do that usually within minutes of each other. We'll put out a technical advisory. They'll put out a, uh, uh, their research findings and the vendor will put out their security bulletin. So that's, and then we close the ticket, close ticket. Um, next. May, may I interject? Please do. So j just real quickly, is anyone in the room um, involved in supplying uh, aviation components, hardware, software. Okay, so your aviation vendors of some of some kind. Yeah. Okay. And if you don't want to raise your hand, that's fine. Um, I, I do want to note uh, my part of my point in this presentation is to actually speak to that audience. So the, any, everyone's welcome, of course, to see the talk. But uh, um, I want to reinforce a couple things Katie said. This very first uh, block, first two blocks here in that first arrow. If that doesn't happen, none of the rest of this process takes place. What you have is things like a uh, researcher who finds no, who gets no love, drops zero day on the internet and publishes, right? Or it doesn't ever get reported, and uh, there's a latent vulnerability sitting around for years and years and years. Um, and that's, yeah, so um, critical, critical, critical step is that uh, suppliers and vendors have a way to receive reports, and then the rest of this process takes some work as well, but please, please, please be open to receiving these reports. It's not all that difficult. Um, you know, there's some discussion about the, the timelines and how long it takes to patch safety critical embedded systems. We understand that's different than updating my uh, Android phone or your iPhone, you know, every, every so often. There are differences there, but please try to open up the doors to be able to receive the reports. That's my pitch. Thing. Yeah, okay, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so in the cases that we don't do it in 45 days or 90 days, that does happen. It usually happens in our industrial control system world, which aviation falls into industrial control systems. In the industri industrial control systems, we're looking at safety systems. So we will hold a vulnerability and not disclose that during the typical 45, 90-day time window if the vendor is being responsive and actively trying to fix the thing. Um, we want to be the honest broker in this situation. We have no desire to ruin anyone's day. Um, but as a, I have a responsibility to the taxpayer and to the citizen to be the honest broker and to be the unbiased, uh, unbiased arbiter of this situation. So I always tell people I don't work for the vendor, I don't work for the researcher, I work for the taxpayer, and my job is to keep eyes on prize and make sure that that 
system admin in Newington, New Hampshire has the access to the information that they need to do their job and to secure their systems appropriately. So when we say we disclose, there is flexibility in that timeline and we want to make sure everybody's rights are advocated for, which includes the vendor. Um, we want to make sure that the vendor has the opportunity to fix the vulnerability and to be on board. It helps the vendor be able to disclose in an appropriate way where their message is actually getting out appropriately. The last thing we want is to say something and then the vendor to come back and be like, actually, you're completely wrong and here's all the ways you're wrong. We don't want that to happen. So we painstakingly go through uh, with the researcher and with the vendor and make sure that everyone's needs are being represented equally. Um, sometimes that means that if you're 80% happy, you're 20% unhappy, and that happens. That's the nature of compromise. Um, but we do work very diligently to do that. So why do we think that we should disclose? Um, we believe it's herd immunity. Uh, we think that our mission is to make software safer, and we do this by saying that each individual disclosure may be painful, but we have have to look at the overarching ecosystem here. So our job is to make things safer, to be that pull that pulls the community in the in the way of safe, safer and more secure software, hardware, um, and digital services. As the government, we're not making money. We provide everything for free to the customer. Um, so we have a unique capability to do that, to be that pull, to be that push. Um, so that, that's kind of why we feel that you should disclose. We think that the 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 Vulnerability disclosure in and of itself may be painful, but as we do it more and more and more, this thing becomes routine, um, and it makes everybody safer. Shining the light of day is the best medicine for any for any kind of ail ailment. Um, so that's that's really the reason why we disclose. Um, you gonna hit the next one? All right. So this is the vulnerability ecosystem as we see it within Department of Homeland Security. This is based on product vulnerabilities, not digital services vulnerabilities, but essentially it would work the same way. Um, so when we're looking at this, uh, as I said earlier, the researchers, so the top swim lane is all happening internally under embargoed status. Nobody is saying anything until everyone says everything. So the researcher comes to us um, after they have gone to the vendor or the asset owner. Um, they come to us. We do either it goes, if it's an IT system, it goes to Carnegie Mellon. If it's an industrial control system, it goes to uh, Idaho National Laboratories. Um, we look at that information. We validate that information. We work with the vendor to validate it if we don't have the equipment to do it ourselves. Uh, we do some analysis looking at it and deduplicating. We will reserve a CVE. We are CVE naming authorities ourselves, and we can populate, populate and publish CVEs ourselves. Once we're all ready to go, patches have been developed, security research is ready to go, everyone's on the same page, we then move into the bottom swim lane, which is the public-facing ar architecture. So everyone publishes at the same time. The public advisory goes out. That, po that CVE that was pre-reserved is now Populated. It flows over into the NVD catalog, which is where enriching information and severity scores are applied. Um, the the uh, researcher publishes their results, we publish our results, and the vendor publishes their results at the same time. All of this happens within minutes of each other. That is coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, one little quick note there, uh, there's usually a lot of questions between CVE and NVD and what the differences are. So if you look at CVE, CVE is the common vulnerability uh, in exposures. Um, so it is the definition. So think of it like a dictionary, and then think of NVD like an encyclopedia. It expands upon that word and provides you more enriching information than the original tag does. Um, yep, Art. So if you believe uh, if you believe our pleas to please implement coordinated vulnerability disclosure and like our process and think it'll be great, um, how do I go about this? Uh, we have some some pointers to how how to get started here. Uh, this is a I'm, I'm supposed to try to use more pictures in my slides, so I took a picture of words and put them in my slides. So I'm not doing that well yet. But um, this is from the ANSI. This is American something National Standards something. Uh, ANSI will sell you, resell you, ISO standards, uh, and this is a, st I didn't know there was a set, this is both of the ISO standards, this is international, we have countries throughout the world asking their vendors to implement this before you sell to their governments. Um, international standards on how to do this. Uh, these are not, uh, without, without giving away ANSI and ISO's uh, funding stream, um, I'm personally responsible for a lot of the words in both of these. Uh, they are good, they are not super onerous, there are not a lot of very important shalls that are very hard to implement. All the basic stuff Katie just covered is basically in there. Uh, so it's, it's fairly straightforward, um, but just to, to show there's, there's ample, ample uh, documentation on how to go about this. There's a bunch of free stuff too if you search around, so don't, don't feel you have to pay whatever Swiss francs it costs to, to get these things. Um, so also, you know, so a little bit of how I might, I might go about this, a little more of the why. We are seeing, uh, and the medical device uh, 
uh, sector in the U.S. Is a, is a clear example of this. The FDA, medical device regulator in the U.S., is telling medical device manufacturers that coordinated disclosure is part of your pre-market, uh, sorry, post-market, right, 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 post-market. They have both out, sorry. Uh, the post-market guidance. So um, part of, of, of managing and maintaining and keeping tabs on my medical device uh, is that I will fix bugs and receive bug reports. And that's the FDA's out ahead of this thing. But uh, also proof that other, other uh, embedded safety critical sectors can do this and have done it. ICS has come a long way. There's an, IC, there's an entire ICS cert, and there wasn't. So one was created, and it works. That's right. You remember when there was not one, right? Yeah, OK. Um, and here we have the regulator act, taking an active, active role. The FDA has been out at Vegas all week doing stuff. So they're over at the biohacking village. But um, it's possible. It's been done. Not a lot of, whole lot of argument as to why not anymore. So, OK. Uh, moving on, other couple other of our concepts. Uh, again, for the, for the suppliers in the room, software bill of materials. Anyone heard this term recently at all? Yep, OK, right. So do you know all the, yeah, did you talk to Alan Friedman recently? All right. Uh, does anyone, do you know all the software running on your stuff? I, sus I suspect some folks in this industry might. I mean all the software. How many DNS resolvers do you have? How many versions of OpenSSL do you have? Um, does your supplier and their supplier and their supplier know? Use any, uh, use any Broadcom stuff? Do you have VxWorks running anywhere? Because those have vulnerabilities like everything and they're embedded in the supply chain. Uh, do you know who Interpeak is and what IPNet is? Because you need to know this. It's part of your supply chain. This is just a dumb example we're going to follow. Um, maybe you use open source uh, GPL to code and you have a legal requirement to track that code and sort of pass the license along. If I fly home today and I do the back of my infotainment system, somewhere in the about menu is going to be a bunch of open source stuff if they're following the legal requirement. Uh, you like high assurance components where they have not been tampered with and you have assurance that they're legit. Yes, we want that in the safety industry. Um, and overall, lower cost. Better efficiency, better higher quality suppliers, fewer suppliers. There's a bunch of dimming work on this. Uh, the theory is that cleaner supply chain gets you security and uh, lower cost. Two for one. Um, this is from a, a, a very nice, uh, well, a, a very good advisory from the researcher uh, on some Broadcom uh, stack vulnerabilities. And a very simple statement here. At the time of the publication, at least a year ago, we don't know what's affected. And today we know exactly nothing more than that. It's very, very difficult to track this. Um, Broadcom's actually not super forthcoming about, they have like a proprietary driver that they probably fixed. There's evidence of that. And it's an open source driver with some patches. And it's not clear that they fixed it. No one will actually say anything. And I don't know if anyone's actually, actually tested. Horrible. Also, if you read this one, there's a very, very long disclosure timeline, which illustrates Katie's point earlier. Uh, blow by blow by blow, the researchers path through the coordination process. And I'm pretty sure that one of us is in there later on, so, okay. Uh, more build of material stuff, right? So Wind River uh, Systems, VxWorks, actually Intel bought Wind River Systems, uh, recently uh, had, oh, sorry, Armis. Armis published Urgent 11 a couple of weeks ago, and all the news was VxWorks, VxWorks, Wind River Systems. And if you read a little more carefully, and the Wind River Advisory is very clear on this, but you have to read all the words, not just the title, um, they talk about Interpeak software, an entire company that they purchased in 2006 that before that date sold their vulnerable TCPI stack to other people like Integrity, OSE. I don't know who those systems are. Does anyone know, familiar with those? Yeah. Oh, Green Hills is Integrity? Okay, sure. So that, that's a Linux. -y. Linux is, is Green Hills Linux or is it a separate thing entirely? Okay. So, yeah, see what I know, right? So point being, it's not, the scope of this is not VxWorks. It is broader than VxWorks. And you have to go back up the supply chain to Interpeak and then back out to everyone else who's affected. Do we know who's affected by this? No. Um, here's what we're asking for. Could we start with an ingredients list? This is a bad, you know, bad Zoom, but we have this for, for food, right? It's not telling me do or don't eat this. The answer is probably shouldn't eat it, but, you know. <laughs> and nothing against Doritos. I love Doritos, but they're not really healthy for you. So, but... You know, if I, uh, if I am gluten-free, I can read uh, whey in there or something, right, and, and know not to eat this. So it's my, it's the, it's the consumer's choice, right, the, the parts consumer's choice to decide, is this good for me or not? Um, but at least I know what's in there. So we want the transparency. So here's the Alan Friedman pitch. Uh, there is currently a Department of Commerce in TIA effort going on uh, to, on software uh, component transparency. We call it SBOM in the working groups, but transparency is the more uh, politically correct term. 
Um, meeting on September 5th in person, wide open to the public, which is one of the ups and downs about these processes. Um, this has been going on for a year plus at this point, and we are nearing a uh, conclusion, which will probably be, I'm going to guess, three sort of white papers come out. But there's been a lot of thought going into um, what does a really interoperable global supply chain uh, SBOM system look like? It's actually a hard, hard, hard problem because you have to uniquely name all of the pieces of software on the internet. Um, but this is going on. You can, there's a lot more on this website to just, you can follow some of the links and find some of the works in progress and a bunch of references. Um, so going quickly, next acronym, secure over the air updates. We want secure updates. Remember, all the software is vulnerable. And we're going to accept that, and that's OK. Uh, but we have to patch it because it's vulnerable, right? In most cases. Isolate works mostly. Um, and OK, so does the nice acronym. But over the air really works best with your crappy IoT and your phones are already on the, on the, on the wireless network. That's fine. Uh, I'm not suggesting that airplanes just grab OTA updates from wherever. But um, you can take out the OTA part. But we want secure updates is the very, is the very important piece here, right? Secure is super, super important, even if over the air is not. Um, downloading and running something without verifying that it's solid, you know, cryptographically verifying that it's good, bad, bad, bad idea. The CVE dictionary is littered with examples of insecure update in blank, insecure update in blank. People keep not doing these correctly. Um, it takes some work. You have to build this into the, the platform and your, ar your architecture and your infrastructure. You have to do key management of some kind. Uh, and we have cases where, you know, uh, a window, a Microsoft uh, following the PKI, one of their code signing keys gets popped and used by malware. So it passes, uh, you know, Microsoft's code signing checks. So you have centralized risk. Um, if all of the updates are signed by the keys in one location and there's one update server and somebody spends a lot of money to pop it, like not pet you that cost $10 billion is the wired estimate. Um, that's bad news. So you have to have, we want, you want your secure updates, but you have to be careful with the update process uh, itself. Um, we recognize, I'm not, a, I'm not a safety critical systems expert, but I've, I'm able to read enough words that I understand that. I have a certified system. It's locked down. It's set a certain way. I made a change to it. That may require a recertification of the whole thing, of part of it. That's an extra cost and a problem we have to consider. I don't have an answer, but I understand that it's not as simple as I'm going to accept my Android update at some point probably when I'm back in Pittsburgh, uh, just, just in case. Uh, and, you know, something went wrong, right? I, I updated the thing, and before I put the equipment back into production, I tested, and something's not, doesn't, send, I'm getting an error code, doesn't feel right. Um, you want a built-in way to roll back, a separate partition, maybe two computers on the piece of hardware, in case one, you know, we're talking about redundancy anyway, so turn that one off, reboot, go back to the known good, known good configuration. There's tricks to do this. Um, I have a dumb PFSense firewall, not a critical system. It has that sort of fallback uh, capability built into it, open source free firewall software. Um, yep. So how do I do this? You can read about these two things. Uh, I believe this is an NSF partly funded uh, bit of work. All of the details that I glossed over about how to, all the little devils in the details on how to do secure updates, read about the update framework. Uptain is a uh, update framework specific example for automobiles. Uh, automobile manufacturers are using Uptane, real ones in real life, to do their updates. So it's entirely possible. Okay, that was a lot of information kind of thrown at you really, really quickly, and we're sorry about that, but we only get so much time. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I want to finish by saying, like, we understand that this is complicated and we're asking for a lot of things, but the reason we titled this uh, The Ideas Whose Time Has Come is because we genuinely believe that these things need to be adopted. They need to have been adopted years ago, and we're still not seeing it. Um, so we're talking about safety-critical things here. Uh, these are basic things that we can do. We're not naive enough to believe that it's a, just a quick fix over the overnight and we can all get it worked on. We understand software bill of sales is complicated and hard and we haven't worked through the through the kinks on it we get it we totally do i think we're all intelligent people and everyone in this room is an intelligent person who understands the the complexity and the nuance of what's actually going on here but we do believe very very strongly that some of these things need to happen um I, yeah, so I, I just want to finish up with this one quote, or whether, and then we'll we'll take a couple questions because I think we'll have a minute or two. Um, I I tend to always when you hear me talk, I will always say these things. I will always say one: the opposite of love is not hate; it's indifference. Um, and that means that if you have negative things that you want to say to me, that is okay. Tell me those things because feedback is so important in this cycle. I can take something being something negative as long as you're professional and not abusive. Um, 
if when you stop talking to me, that's when I know there's really a problem because that means that tells me that you don't care anymore. And that's the last thing we want to see. The second is that I love this quote. It's uh, vulnerability sounds like truth and feels like courage. Truth and courage are never are always comfortable, but they're never weakness. We often come to the table believing that if we just hide things or don't admit to things and they don't exist anymore, that's not true. Also, when we come to the table, that's not admitting a place of weakness. That's not saying you've lost ground. Um, these things are uncomfortable. We get it. We totally do. We deal with 16 critical infrastructure sectors. I've dealt with thousands of vulnerabilities. I told you how many when we started. Um, this can be done. It has been done. We have several success stories, and it's been going on for 30 years. Um, our, and then we got a question. Questions. Go to questions. Yeah. Question, sir. Yep. So uh, I'll point to recently we released a disclosure, um, a, an aviation disclosure. Um, from day one, when we received that, we brought in the FAA and the Aviation ISAC, and we coordinated with both of them on that disclosure well before we ever released it to the public. We don't want anyone caught, caught off guard. That's the point of coordinated voter vulnerability disclosure. We want to bring in the people who have the opportunity to fix things. We do have timelines that are one to two years. They usually come in the form of things like nuclear power plants. Nobody wants to see that fail. Um, so you get a, a faulty patch, and it's a bad, bad day for hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. Um, it, it, so we, we, do, we do that. And as I said, as long as we have a positive relationship with the vendor and the vendor is being responsive, if the vendor is trying to stall or the researcher is trying to stall or there's just negativity or something going on there, then, then we'll move forward. But for the most part, we, have, we do our very best to make sure that everyone's needs are being advocated for. And we're very, very responsive to the fact that we understand things take longer. The Aviation timeline is 25 years. Like we get it, we truly do. But we, what we don't want to see is the same flaws that exist right now built into the next harbor life cycle. Yeah, we, we realize, you know, ours, our, our cert CCs is a 45-day soft deadline. Google Project Zero is 90 with an optional 14. We fully recognize those are not long enough, but forever is also too long. So we need to, you know, years, small number of years, large number of months, we need to get it down. So. Were you paid to ask that question? Did somebody like, okay, awesome. Um, so the first step for me in my world is make sure if you are a vendor that there is a clear channel for researchers or public policy people to talk to you. Um, there's this weird thing that has happened throughout the years here and uh, we've done all the social engineering training and now people are doing all the social engineering training. Um, and so what happens is that uh, in part of my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, good job. And the other part I'm like, oh no. Um, because when I call, hi, I'm Katie from the Department of Homeland Security, and I'd like to talk to your product security team because we believe we found a vulnerability in your software. They go, that's nice. Homeland Security? Uh-huh. Click. Um, and we spend days going through the same 1-800 number that everyone else does. Um, so I would say the first step is to publicly... Uh, acknowledge and create a vulnerability disclosure program so that a researcher or a public policy member or somebody who needs to talk to that that particular group of people who can handle that has the avenue to do that. That saves everyone time and effort. And what happens is when, when people can't get to the right people, then they go crazy and they just publish on Twitter. And we don't need that. Um, the IT world has re gotten really good at this, and so we'd like to see that. Sir, you had one more? I think we were going to... Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's totally true. And it doesn't have to happen. We, we've we had several sectors when we first tried to start doing this. Medical was one of them. Um, every single conversation was a conversation between lawyers. We don't need to do that. As this gets more routine, we it, it becomes less and less uh, argumentative. Yeah, I think we're being kicked off stage. Uh, we're, we're able to answer questions. Um, thank you all for your time. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Aviation Village. Well done this year.